Angels in America, a gay fantasia on national themes by Tony Kushner, has been critically acclaimed as one of the greatest plays of all time. It has been received as a highly relevant, complex work since its original release in 1991, and has since had hundreds of performances and productions produced, as well as gaining a Pulitzer Prize and multiple Tony Awards. The two-part play, spanning almost eight hours together and written over the course of six years, tells the story of Pryor Walter, a 30-year-old gay man living in New York City in 1985. He's been diagnosed with AIDS, and his boyfriend, Louis Ironson, abandons their relationship shortly after finding out. Meanwhile, Joe Pitt, a Mormon man working for Roy Cohn, a real-life conservative judge and closeted gay man who died of AIDS, is forced to deal with his own sexuality and his relationship with his Valium-addicted wife, Harper. The play follows many themes throughout, including American politics around the time of the AIDS epidemic, homophobia, racism, religion, democracy, power, and change. Each character faces many internal conflicts, making this play extremely relatable and beloved by audiences. Angels in America as a whole is a relevant, culturally important show that has had a major impact on theater and gay culture, especially regarding AIDS awareness and the creation of political pieces. Each character in Angels in America is extremely unique and plays a necessary part in the piece as a whole, and therefore should be analyzed individually. Each action and monologue in the show has a purpose, and arguably, the person with the most need for a purpose is the play's most likable character and protagonist, Prior Walter. Prior Walter is a 30-year-old wasp whose first scene in the play shows him telling his boyfriend of four years, Lewis, that he's been diagnosed with AIDS. Throughout the play, Prior's illness gets worse and his fear of death evidently increases. He constantly feels the need to be up and about because he's afraid that he'll die if he lays around in bed or goes to the hospital for treatment. Lewis breaks up with him shortly after finding out about the diagnosis, leaving Pryor alone to suffer with his illness. Pryor begins to wake up in the middle of the night to see the ghost of his ancestors, which all ultimately lead up to a huge, regal, babbling angel crashing through his ceiling and declaring him a prophet. Up until this point, Pryor has had a fear of dying an ordinary man with no remarkable accomplishments, notably because he is only 30 years old and is supposed to have the rest of his life to achieve his goals. Living as a scared queen with a bad leg and nightly hallucinations isn't necessarily on that list, so he longs for his old life with his ex-boyfriend. Meanwhile, Lewis is off having other affairs. Lewis Ironson is possibly one of the most interesting characters in the show, simply because he is a neurotic, complex, secularly Jewish man that quite literally speaks his every thought. His abandonment of Pryor is a huge motif throughout the show that brings light to how AIDS not only put a strain on the people diagnosed with it, but also the loved ones of the people affected. His storyline revolves around him leaving Pryor and hooking up with Joe Pitt, the Reagan-supporting Mormon councilman discovering things about his own sexuality. In one scene of the play, Lewis tries to justify his actions to Pryor by saying that he's only sleeping with Joe for companionship, to which Pryor responds the following. Companionship. Mmm. You know, just when I think he couldn't possibly say anything to make it worse, he does. Companionship. How good. I, I wouldn't want you to be lonely. There are thousands of gay men in New York City with AIDS, and nearly every one of them is being taken care of by a friend. or by a lover who has stuck by them through things worse than mine so far. Everyone got that, except me. I got you. Why? What's wrong with me? Lewis himself doesn't fully understand why he felt that he had to abandon his lover. Directly after Pryor tells him of his condition, Lewis goes to a rabbi and asks what the Holy Writ says about someone who abandons someone he loves in a time of great need. Lewis goes on about how sores, vomit, disease, and death really frighten him, which is understandable. The audience comprehends that Lewis has been put in a difficult situation, especially with AIDS, a sexually transmitted disease, being thrown into his relationship. However, Pryor's humor and sense of humanity has been established, therefore making him a likable character, and people watching the story play out root for Lewis to stay with Pryor and support him. Unfortunately, after Pryor has a dramatic health decline in the middle of the night, Lewis is forced to question whether or not his relationship is worth the emotional and physical turmoil that Pryor's disease would put on him. While he is speaking aloud to a nurse about the famous embroiderer Lorraine Mathilde's loyalty to her husband, he ends up realizing that he doesn't have what it takes to support Pryor through his illness. She waited for him, she stitched for years, and if he had come back broken and defeated from war, she would have loved him even more. 
And if he had returned mutilated, ugly, full of infection and horror, she would still have loved him, fed by pity, by a, a sharing of pain, and she would have loved him even more and even more, and she would never, never have prayed to God, please let him die if he can return to me whole and healthy and able to live a normal life. If he had died, she would have buried her heart with him. So what the fuck is the matter with me? Lewis proceeds to immediately leave Pryor for good and go out to cruise the ramble for a new hookup. While he has made it clear that part of the reason he left Pryor was his fear of contracting AIDS, Lewis insists on protected sex with a stranger in the park until the condom breaks. The man asks Lewis what he wants to do, and he replies, Keep going. Infect me. I don't care. This is a strange response, especially considering that he insisted on using a condom beforehand to avoid being infected with anything. Lewis may have decided that he doesn't care because he feels a certain guilt surrounding his abandonment of Pryor, but also because he already views himself as a victim and feels that he can just throw caution to the wind, and that if he gets AIDS, it couldn't be much worse than how he already feels. Throughout the play, Lewis's layers begin to show, and he gradually becomes less and less sympathetic. Between giving a dizzying 23-minute monologue filled with racial stereotypes and privileged perspectives, blaming Pryor for being too much of a victim, and his relationship with Joe, a man who stands for everything Lewis opposes, Lewis ends up being extremely dislikable, but startlingly the most human character in the show. Joe Pitt, Lewis's new lover, also has a fascinating story of his own. He is introduced as a councilman for Roy Cohn, a real historical figure famous for being the judge on the Julius and Ethel Rosenberg case, which will later be described more in depth. Joe is a very conservative, self-loathing Mormon man married to Harper, a Valium-addicted housewife. Joe finds himself struggling with his own sexuality and attractions battling that internal conflict while trying to stay faithful to his religion and beliefs as well as deal with the political climate in the mid-1980s. He deals with these intense amounts of internalized homophobia, which personally make him very relatable for me. I was raised Mormon, and coming to the realization that I may have been something other than straight was terrifying. I experienced a load of self-hatred and confusion, and the stereotype about Mormons repressing and ignoring any feelings they dislike is very true. This is perfectly illustrated in a scene where Joe drunkenly calls his mother, Hannah, at 4 o'clock in the morning and tells her that he's gay. After spilling the news to her, Joe waits a few moments for Hannah to respond, and once she does, it isn't pretty. You're old enough to understand that your father didn't love you without being ridiculous about it. What? You're ridiculous! You're being ridiculous! I, I, I am... what? You really ought to go home now to your wife. I need to go to bed. This phone call. We will just forget this phone call. Mom, I... No more talk tonight. This drinking is a sin. A sin. I raised you better than that. Joe's entire personality surrounds his desire for both chaos and order. His whole belief system is based on rules and law, but delving into his sexuality begins to derail all of that. Both Roy and Lewis, the two main men in Joe's life, give him the advice that he needs to learn to loosen up. Lewis tells Joe right before his coming out scene, sometimes, even if it scares you to death, you have to be willing to break the law. Roy, on the other hand, ever the power-hungry judge and a father figure to Joe, gives him the advice, make the law or subject to it. And later, there are so many laws, find one you can break. Joe's fear of living outside the norm eats him alive throughout the show, despite the fact that he is a proud Mormon man with a Valium-addicted wife and a secret boyfriend on the side. Joe's attraction to evil is also part of the reason for his downfall. Not only is he working directly with the most evil character in the show, Roy Cohn, but he also laments about Harper in the following monologue. And what scares me is that maybe what I really love in her is the part of her that's farthest from the light, from God's love. And maybe I was drawn to that in the first place, and I'm keeping it alive because I need it. Joe eventually does loosen up a little bit in a memorable and symbolic scene where he sheds his skin for Lewis. Joe explains that the reason he wears a temple garment, or white underclothes typically worn by Mormons, is for protection, like a second skin. After giving Lewis a speech about how he supports his decision in leaving prior, Joe strips off his clothes and tells Lewis that he feels free for the first time in his life. Despite the new risk of contracting AIDS, he has decided that he doesn't care as long as he can be with Lewis and begin to live life with less worries. One of the things that makes Angels in America painfully relevant in modern times, even almost 30 years after its initial opening, is the characterization of Roy Cohn. Cohn was not only Donald Trump's right-hand man, but better known as the judge of the Julius and Ethel Rosenberg case. Julius Rosenberg had been accused of being a Russian spy during the Red Scare, and when he refused to give the court any answers, Cohn had his wife, Ethel, arrested. 
Eventually, both Julius and Ethel were sentenced to death for treason. Roy Cohn stood by his decision until the day he died. Ironically, although Cohn was a known conservative that stood against gay rights, he contracted AIDS from one of the men he had slept with and died in 1986, as portrayed in the play. Throughout the show, Roy is shown as a powerful, controlling man that is always speaking on the phone and losing his temper. As he starts to get sicker and sicker, he begins to see the ghost of Ethel Rosenberg haunting him. She taunts him, and he begins to grow respect for her as he gets weaker, because she's still managing to get in his head even after her death. Roy becomes somewhat of a father figure to Joe, because Joe's father left him when he was a child. Roy acts as Joe's mentor throughout the play, giving him advice on power and control. Roy lies to everyone about his illness, telling them he has liver cancer because he doesn't want people to know about his sexuality. He has a lot of changes once he gets checked into the hospital for his condition, however. There he meets Belize, a nurse and Pryor's best friend. Roy Cohn, someone who is used to having everything handed to him on a silver platter, now has a black gay drag queen as his nurse. And as he and his health slowly deteriorate, so does his power. Belize takes advantage of the situation and uses Roy's abundant stash of AZT to provide for his friends like Pryor, who can't afford the drug. The contrast between the two is terrifying. Roy states, I'm not afraid of death. What can death bring that I haven't faced? I've lived. Life is the worst. Meanwhile, at the end of the play, Pryor finds himself in heaven, pleading to angels to give him more life because he doesn't want to die yet. He feels as if he hasn't had time to do anything. This brings up a sad point regarding the privilege of the rich during the AIDS epidemic. Pryor, who so desperately wants to live, struggles to survive because he can't afford treatment, while Roy, who doesn't care if he dies, has enough medication to help hundreds of people less fortunate than him. However, the show also brings in the theme of class versus mortality, wherein Pryor, the poorer character with a better heart, miraculously survives, while Roy, the rich character with a terrible life perspective, dies. Besides the characters, which drive the show and present themes galore, Angels in America also manages to brilliantly paint a picture of the political and social climate in American culture during the AIDS epidemic. The play makes many references to Ronald Reagan, Ed Koch, Joseph McCarthy, and of course, Roy Cohn and Ethel Rosenberg, all important politicians, and one victim of the Red Scare, that helped to shape the political climate of the mid-1980s. The show also does a fantastic job of portraying the gay community in New York during the AIDS crisis, showing Pryor and Belize coming back from a funeral for their friend, as well as outside perspectives by Harper, Joe, Hannah, and Roy. Angels in America, with a majority of its characters living in some minority group, also comments heavily on how problematic America can be, especially under Reagan's presidency, where the government basically ignored the AIDS epidemic because it was labeled as a gay disease. In an impassioned scene where Lewis remarks on the possibilities the country has, Belize replies with his own scornful opinion. Well, I hate America, Lewis. I hate this country. It's just big ideas and stories and people dying and people like you. The white cracker wrote the national anthem knew what he was doing. He set the word free to a note so high, nobody can reach it. <laughs> that was deliberate. Nothing on earth sounds less like freedom to me. You come with me to room 1013 over the hospital. I'll show you America. Terminal, crazy, and mean. I live in America, Lewis. That's hard enough. I don't have to love it. The presence of religion is also a very strong theme in the play. Joe, Harper, and Hannah are obviously Mormon, and their beliefs carry throughout the show, causing Joe's sexuality to have an effect on all of them. In fact, Joe relates a Bible story he used to read to his realization of his homosexuality. I had a book of Bible stories when I was a kid, and there was a picture I'd look at 20 times every day. Jacob wrestles with the angel. I don't really remember the story or why the wrestling, just the picture. <laughs> Jacob is young and very strong. The angel is a... A beautiful man with golden hair and wings. Of course, I still dream about it many nights. I'm, it's me in that struggle, fierce and unfair. The angel is not human and it holds nothing back. So how could anyone human win? What kind of a fight is that? It is not just losing it means your soul thrown down in the dust, your heart torn out from gods, but you can't not lose. Joe's sexuality crisis relating to his vivid mental picture of wrestling with an angel becomes ironic near the end of the play where a sick, bedridden Prior Walter, desperate to get rid of the angel constantly showing up and telling him that he's a prophet, literally tries to wrestle with the angel. The angel is another giant theme and symbol of religion throughout this piece. 
Pryor is visited by his ancestors in his bedroom in the middle of the night as his condition gets worse. After he feels like he has finally had enough, an angel crashes through his ceiling and declares him a prophet. The angel is only the tip of the iceberg regarding religious imagery, however. Lewis is a secular Jewish person, and he talks about it quite a bit. It's clearly a big part of his identity, but he momentarily has a miraculous moment of religious Judaism after Roy Cohn dies. Belize, Roy's nurse, has stolen tons of AZT from Roy's endless stash to help his friends with AIDS, and once Roy has died, Belize feels it would be appropriate to get Lewis to say the mourner's kaddish over Roy's body to thank him for the pills. Lewis initially refuses, given that he hates Roy and everything that he stood for, but Belize reminds him that the kaddish is all about forgiveness and peace, and Lewis finally agrees. He struggles to remember it until the ghost of Ethel Rosenberg appears and begins to recite the kaddish along with him. One nice moment in the play is one where Hannah, Joe's mother, takes Pryor to the hospital while he's having a breathing problem caused by pneumonia. While he is in bed trying to distract himself, he has a conversation with her about her Mormon beliefs. And I'm sorry, but it's repellent to me. So much of what you believe. What do I believe? I'm a homosexual with AIDS. I can only imagine what you- No, you can't imagine the things in my head. You don't make assumptions about me, mister. I won't make them about you. Fair enough. Overall, Angels in America, A Gay Fantasia on National Themes by Tony Kushner is considered one of the greatest plays ever written, and not without reason. Most importantly, it taught the people affected by AIDS how to heal. It was best explained by Ron Liebman, the actor who played Roy Cohn in the 1992 Los Angeles production of the show, in the book The World Only Spins Forward, The Ascent of Angels in America by Isaac Butler and Dan Coys. Guys with AIDS, different stages, they wanted to see the play. The theater went out of its way to make sure they got seats, but they needed to sit a lot of them close because the hearing was going, the eyesight was going. At curtain call, we could see the first couple of rows. The lights would spill over. We could see the audience. The audience would generally give a standing ovation, but to see guys who could barely stand giving us a standing ovation, you know, out of their wheelchairs. We were doing a play, yes, but it became something else.